All right, well, good afternoon. And um, welcome again. Um, I hope the morning sessions went well. I've been told uh, by several that, uh, that the sessions, in fact, were, uh, were going quite well. Uh, and a uh, few were able to meet a bit with Peter afterwards as well. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I would still believe, I believe, although Peter has gone home, uh, I believe there are probably some copies of books. So if you haven't picked up a copy, uh, please do so. Um, I am here to introduce uh, one of my board members, uh, Dee Davis. Um, the Institute has 18 board members, and so, um, and several of them are in various capacities in the workshop, so you're getting a bit of seeing what the bench strength is, what the leadership strength is of the Institute. Um, so um, it's, it's been, this has been a great, great opportunity for us. Dee is the founder of the Center for Rural Strategies, and he's helped design and lead national public information campaigns. Let's get the scroll going. <laughs> On topics as diverse as commercial television programming and federal banking policy. Uh, Dee began his me media career in 1973 as a trainee at Apple Shop, which, by the way, is a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource and, and store for uh, traditional music, uh, folk, uh, uh, <coughs> folk arts, and, and, um, and um, uh, traditional reading ma materials on, on uh, culture and art in the Appalachians. Uh, Apple Shop is an arts and cultural center devoted to exploring Appalachian life and social issues in Whitesburg, Kentucky. He went on to serve as executive producer of Apple Shop Films and Headwaters Television. <clears throat> and during his tenure, the organization created more than 50 public TV commentaries, uh, established a media training program for Appalachian youth, and launched initiatives that use media as a strategic tool in organization and development. Dee served as president and chairman of the board of the Independent Television Service, president of Kentucky Citizens for the Arts, and is a panelist and consultant to numerous private and public agencies. <clears throat> Dee also serves on the board of directors of the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation, the Fund for Innovation, Innovative Television, and Feral Arts of Brisbane, Australia. He's also a member of the national advisory boards of the Institute for Rural Jour Journalism and Community Issues, and the Rural Policy Research Institute. Uh, and as I said, he's also a member of the Board of Directors for the Institute for Work in the Economy. Dee received an English degree from the University of Kentucky, and he lives in Whitesburg, Kentucky. So, Dee. Thanks, Pete, and uh, thanks all you folks. I, I'm glad to be here, um, and thank you for the work you're doing. You're really on the front lines of rebuilding a lot of communities, and um, I know how important that work is. I, um, I come from a small town in eastern Kentucky in the coal fields. Um, there's a billboard when you come into town, it says, Weisberg home of 1,532 friendly people and two grouches. And so I always endeavor, no matter what I was, I'm feeling in the morning, I endeavor to stay on the right side of that. Um, um, it, like a lot of Coalfield communities, it's a poor community. There's a, you know, we have our, we have our issues. I, uh, I was uh, listening to uh, Peter this morning, and I was thinking, well, you know, we're not the worst. And then I started thinking, well, can, our congressional district is the poorest, and we have the worst life expectancy in the country. So now I'm going to just turn that to, well, it could be worse. Um, but, it's, but it's a great place to live in, in some respects. There's, there's a good community. There's a lot of cultural. Um, 
reasons to be there, to be part of that community. Also, uh, their, their indulgences. One of the things I was just thinking this, this past week, I happened to be driving back and forth, and there's, there's this uh, radio station. I don't know if in your communities you have these swap shops on the radio. Do you, I don't know, you know what the tradio on the radio? We, there's this one station. It's like 10 counties. Of, everybody calls in to this um, this Tradio, which is, is like, it, it's kind of eBay and Angie's List and PetSmart and Cars.com, everybody. And I, I was just, I made note of some of the things I was getting, you know, people were selling because you get a real glimpse of, of what the community's like. There's one guy said, 10 hand saws that he was going to let go for 10 bucks. Another guy had six chainsaws, $50 a piece. One guy had a 83 F-150 uh, truck with four good tires and a camper top for $300. <laughs> um, so, uh, one, one guy had 10 rod and reels that he was going to uh, let go for 40 bucks for the whole lot. You, you know there's a story there. And then somebody had a Keith Urban guitar and amplifier with the 30 CDs that come with it. As you know, there's heartbreak there. And uh, some, one guy had a, a best offer for a 42-inch Troy-built riding lawnmower. Uh, it cuts good, but it just doesn't want to go fast. Uh, somebody had 14 electric pole glass insulators. He let them all go for $3. And uh, a woman had an umbrella stroller that said it was for a baby, it said it was just like new, and she was asking five bucks. Uh, I got addicted to this show, listening and over the years, and my favorite one of all time was I, I heard somebody call in and say, uh, uh, Bud, I still got this wiener dog that showed up with no collar, blind in one eye, and answers to the name of Willow. And I kept thinking, how many names did she have to go through to get to Willa? But, but I had a, I have another pal who, uh, who worked for a while at the station, and she came in from Indiana, and she, she didn't sound exactly like the rest of us, but uh, th they, they put her on as a sub one day when somebody got sick, and she was, she was doing the show, and she said a guy called in and said he had a gallon of gas for sale. She said, God, she started thinking, I know these people are poor, but God, that's unbelievable. So she said, well, this gentleman has a gallon of gas to sell, and he said, uh, excuse me, ma'am. No, I said I had a cow and a calf to sell. <laughs> so, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, rural, rural. So just think of this. This is the world. The world's population is about, whatever, three and a half billion. That's, that's the world's population. Now, and up to about 2010, half of it was urban, half of it was rural. So we've been in this long time getting to that middle of the road, right? And, and if you think about the world and you think about urban and rural, you know that there have been a lot of somewhat sustainable communities uh, been hanging on for a long time, and they're beginning to show signs of wear. And if you, you look at the, the rural world, a lot of that is where the poverty is, where the greatest poverty is. And, and if, you, if you look at places like Burkina Faso, where the cotton crop failed, or if you look at, the, at Kenya and the cattle economy of the Maasai, or if you look at Pakistan and where people are trying to make do, you, you're seeing more and more strategies to get people out of those rural communities, these, these communities that have been self-sufficient for a long time, and move them into cities, and to give them a kind of work. And this, the idea being that there's more economic activity in density, 
and that people, there, there's more service jobs, and that that's, that's a system. It's, it's work in some ways, but it also has cultural costs as people lo leave their home. We spent some time working in Kenya, and you see the, su the greatest suburb in Africa is this slum around Nairobi where all these people have been dream about making enough money to go back and buy a patch of land to farm or to bury them so. The, then if you think of the United States, okay, 100 years ago, this is the United States population, half urban, half rural. Well, so lot's changed in that, that 100 years. Right now, you look at it, about a little less than 20%, about 60 million people are rural. A little, just about that amount, a little bit more in the central cities, urban, and then 60% of the country is suburban. Still, the poverty is more intense in the rural area, but not much more than in the central cities. And you could look at indexes different ways, say they're very similar. And, but you've got about, about one in four kids in rural areas living in poverty. We, we think we understand rural, and a lot of times we have the perceptions. We, pe people kind of think, well, rural is all white and redneck and Trump voters. And I'm not saying there's no rednecks in rural America, but what I, what I would say is that it's about eight percentage points less diverse than the country as a whole. And if you look at the long-term demographics in 20 years, most rural counties are going to be majority people of color. So it's, it's, it's different than the country as a whole, but it's not so different. We were, we were shooting about, I'm trying to think when it was, 2007, somewhere like that, up in um, South Dakota, there was a community in Lake Preston. It's the community where a lake showed up one day. They weren't expecting, and a 17-mile lake, and I understand things like that happened. Uh, I never saw it happen, but I'm understanding that it happened. Anyway, um, there was a town where they were about to lose their drugstore. This drugstore would mean that people would have to drive 25 minutes one way to get their prescription filled or 45 minutes the other way to get the prescription filled. And, and that was also a kind of commercial center where they sold a lot of, of stuff besides the drugs. So nobody, nobody wanted to take over. Nobody was there prepared to take over. So they, they found a young woman who was finishing up pharmacy school, and the community came together, and they figured out how to make her loans and take care of her student debt and to help her buy this, this place to keep the town together. And at that time, what I remember was uh, Tom Daschle was the um, Senate Majority Leader and he, he toured every county and we, we caught him there in that county and we interviewed him. He said, um, he said that the, the, the great thing about Small towns, rural communities is that everybody's needed. You're needed. You need to be in the band. You're needed to be on the ball team. You needed to coach or to be on the library board. Nobody is unnecessary. Nobody's expendable. And I've thought about that a lot in a lot of different contexts over the years. Um, uh, and, I'm, and particularly, I just want to say one thing uh, as a bit of a personal indulgence. In my hometown uh, last week, I lost a buddy. He, um, he was a, a poet and a, a kind of operated the campground and a radio personality and a, and a, and a pal. We, we uh, stole a lot of horses together, you know. Uh, and, um, and I was thinking, he, he always started his poetry readings with this one uh, short poem he, he said, I don't mind living in a small community. I just wish I was taller. And uh, I, I think in some ways that when we lose people in small towns and these communities, it's hard, they're not easy to replace. You know, it's not, it's not like the churn is there. It's not like we have the density that those losses are felt by everybody. And it, 
and it takes us a while. So, um, I want to I want to talk about a kind of notion of of perception. And we, in rural, where I work at Rural Strategy, and we work on different policy issues, we always say policy follows perception. That is, how you value people, how you value a community, really says a lot about what policies you're going to live with. You know, if you think, if you think people have a lot to offer and, and they can help build your economy, you don't build a wall at the border to keep them out. If you think that people are valuable and, and important to your community, you, you don't leave them isolated on an island after a hurricane. If, if, you, if you have people in the cities who can't get a loan and you see their, their communities redlined, if, if in Appalachia where I live, if a pharmaceutical company starts dumping op opioids, into the community to see what happens to improve a quarterly um, report, then that's, that's because you've got a perception of those people as not valuable, of those people as not contributing, as those people are worth sacrificing. And it's pretty important, I think, for us in, in rural areas, because we think a lot about these cultural transactions. It, it's, um, I mean, if you want to know how somebody votes, it's not because of their pocketbook. They vote because of their culture, right? They vote because of, of their family, their neighbors, their church, their pool hall. That's who they vote like. Nobody, you know, people in rich communities don't, Marin County or Fairfax County, they don't vote to lower their taxes. And people in a lot of poor areas just vote like they vote the, the anger and the resentment, or they vote, they vote what, what's going on in their community at the moment. And um, why I think it's important to understand is that a, a lot of us in rural America see our communities identify by who we used to be, what we used to do particularly, right? that um, people don't, people may, may not be farming anymore, but they identify as farmers. They're cultural farmers. They, they identify as what they used to do. I, um, I got a call last week from a Bloomberg journalist who said he was looking at the most productive farm country in the country, and Nebraska is tremendously profitable. He's, we keep looking and said, but where are the farmers? We can't find anybody farming. Well, there's 2% of rural America, people living on a farm, making a living on a farm. They're not there anymore. It's, I, I heard uh, the Secretary of Agriculture of Kentucky say, we used to have 90,000 farmers. Now we're making all the sausage for the Cracker Barrels. We're making all the biscuits for um, McDonald's. And we got 4,000 farmers in the state. But when you hear people talk about agriculture, it's a, it's a cultural bell, but it's not an economic bell. And I think that's also true with loggers, people who work on oil rigs, miners from my community. It's like um, nobody thinks the mines are going to come back. Nobody thinks coal's going to come back. But they kind of like, when people talk about it, they kind of like being lifted up in a way and thinking about what they used to do, how they used to be contributing to the rest of the country, helping everybody out, not seeming like a basket case, not seeming like a charity case. People who used to work at the plant before the plant moved offshore. That's how a lot of rural America identifies itself. And then when you look at what happens, the, I, I think it also helps to look at the rules, you know, because you guys have to work with all kinds of rules. You know, people have rules. You know, you work with these rules. And we, we sometimes spend more attention, pay, you know, pay attention to the rules and not how we get to them. I have a buddy who's about, he's 5'7". He said that 
the rules of basketball don't favor him. That uh, they favor Shaquille and Neil uh, because of the ten foot goal. He says, he says if a goal was eight feet, it would favor him. And I played ball with him. I don't believe that, but <laughs> but it's a point. And um, and what I think is we we're oftentimes caught way down the line on, the, on this rulemaking, right? I know that, you know, this country started out, all it had was land, and it gave land away. Nobody said, well, that's a, that's a government giveaway. That's how, it's, they didn't have cash. They didn't have tax system. They gave land away, and people came and they added value. Some of them knew how to farm, some of them didn't, but they, 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 they slowly built that up. You look, I'm just looking at the news this past week, um, there was a story about Angela Merkel and uh, Germany just agreed to buy all this natural gas from the United States. Well, that's interesting, and that's, that'll probably uh, help some people in the economy, but we've had a rule for a long time. We've been subsidizing the oil and gas industry by 75 to $80 billion a year. And the, and the reason we did that was because after the Arab oil embargo in the 70s, we wanted energy independence. And so we created a system so we would help these oil and gas companies out and in turn, they wouldn't export the oil. And by the year 2016, we became the number one oil and gas producing country in the world. We were washing gas. I remember buying gas at $1.52 a gallon. And all of a sudden, the prices were too low, the profits were too low, and so now we've got it. We changed the rules so we can export. We can export this fuel under certain conditions, and so the, so those rules change. And uh, um, President Reagan's signature um, accomplishment as an anti-nuclear treaty. We just heard this past week they're going to abandon. Well, that's that's going to be. My, more people making these armaments, private industry, they're going to be subsidized, and that'll be the next rule. So in some ways, we think about these rules, but we don't think about how, we, how they get made. And, and why I think that's important is we got a new set of rules that are coming down. They're going to have real impacts, particularly on small communities, but really on cities as well. And these new rules are rules of technology. And we think about all the new jobs that are created by technology. We don't really think so much about how many jobs are being eliminated by technology. Right now, 60% of all men who have a job drive something as part of that job. The number one job in most states is truck driver. We got both parties working as hard as they can to create self-driving vehicles so that what they are, they are scheduling is that in about 10 years, we will change that whole system and we won't need to have those people employed. Well, whether that's good or bad, it may be inevitable, but there's a whole bit of untethering that's getting ready to happen everywhere. And it's not just with truck drivers. It's with engineers, and it's with medical professionals, and it's with teachers, and it's going to change the character of employment. And when people are untethered, something else is going to happen, and that is they're going to get a chance to live wherever they want to live. Because the whole notion of, I mean, maybe, maybe they'll want to stay in, in densely urban areas and where we can work in service industries, do each other's nails, walk each other's dogs, whatever. But, but part of it is that people want to live where they want to live. And in these recent surveys, I saw a, I saw a um, Bank of America survey that said half of the baby boomers want to move when they retire and half of them want to move to a rural area. I saw a Harris poll that Robin Rather commissioned that said 46% of Americans said they would move to a rural area if they could afford it. They want to move to a rural area that's 
smarter, greener, and more inclusive. They want to move to a rural area that is connected, that is kind, that has schools and healthcare services that, that make a difference. And that's kind of where we can begin to imagine just what, what we could do next. Um, I, I spent about five years in the Gulf after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Um, as devastating as it was on television, and, and you know, what happened in New Orleans was awful. But, if, but in the rural areas, you know, you could drive 50 miles and not see a habitable house standing. You could, from the Texas border to the Alabama border, there was this absolute devastation. And commu communities were sprawling. The, there, were, there was some investment, some money that came, but oftentimes that money went to big corporations like Halliburton, who would subcontract with subcontract and subcontract, and then they would hire four Salvadoran workers who would live in one hotel room in the mud, and, and they would be responsible for taking out all this toxic stuff. It was a horrible situation, and, you know, we see people living under a tree for five months with, uh, with 10,000 FEMA trailers in Arkansas and they couldn't figure out how to get to them. It was a horrible situation. And you kept waiting for that investment to come and to trickle down and to help those people get straight, but it never came, not really. What came was um, this amazing instinct of Americans to help out incredible kinds of service. People from uh, Sunday schools in North Carolina and hunting clubs in Minnesota, people from cities and towns just came in and they mucked out houses, they, they rebuilt them. They invested their time in billions of dollars of equity into those communities just out of kindness, just out of service, and it was a it was a way to fix these things that have been broken and rebuild these communities and uh, give them hope again. Uh, it, it wasn't part of the policy; it was part of the instinct of the country and. Um, I think a lot about how do you how do you monetize decency? You know, we know you can monetize meanness. You know, you can, you know, people can be. Um, you can lower the wages. You can uh, discriminate against people. There's a lot, lots of ways that people can profit off meanness, but uh, we haven't thought as much about how we can how we can begin to build. Uh, on uh, decency, I had a, a buddy who, um, his, his dad was a pack peddler who came in to sell. His, his mom made mining clothes. His dad was a pack peddler. They came, they were a Syrian, which from, I think, Lebanon, where it's now Lebanon. And he would go up and down and sell uh, these, these dungarees for miners. And then, named all his kids after different American presidents and before and and they all grew up and had stores in different towns and before they had chains in Ohio and and in uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and, and um, he said the one thing he learned people tell you you can't make money off your friends he says you can make a lot more money off your friends than you can your enemies and I I think that in a way we have to begin to think about how we rebuild these towns, these communities, and, and how we institutionalize uh, kindness. Um, I want to talk about uh, another, another community, another buddy here in Texas that I've worked with a lot, and that's down on the border. Um, down uh, Ed Couch, Elsa, kind of near McAllen between McAllen and Brownsville. 
there's all these agriculture communities, um, vast colonia. Uh, uh, Frank Guajardo was my board chairman through most of the time at Rural Strategies, and he, he grew up, his family were pickers. Um, he, w he was born in Mexico, but that was because his mother didn't trust the doctors here, so she went back for each of her kids to be born in Mexico. But he said he, he grew up in the summers in Ohio, and it would be his job to uh, take care of the kids at night when the parents were tired. And so they would listen to the Reds on the radio, and, and he and his brothers would repeat what they would hear. They would kind of, in Spanglish, they would both uh, talk about the, the game and talk about the big red machine. Then later, when he was studying, he got to go to Oxford. And uh, when he saw what they were doing in Britain about history, he wanted to come back and capture those histories. And his dad, who, who um, had moved from being a, um, uh, an agricultural worker to a, to a janitor, he said the first thing he did was he went and said, Dad, I'm going to, we're going to get your story. We're going to get your oral history. We're going to write a book for you. And then he put together this whole class of students who would get these oral histories that they thought, their, their asset, what they had was their culture. And so he said they heard the story of, uh, of a man who had, brought the, had built the water system for their town, Ed Couch. And so all the students went out to his house, and, and uh, they, they started talking to him and getting the story. And he, he was explaining it all. And as soon as they found out as he, he was going, that yeah, he was telling the story. He had dug the ditches for the water line. Well, they, they took that story and they made him a hero. And they, they told everybody because that was an important story. Now, I'll skip forward a little bit. Frank is in the middle of a project building the first bilingual university in the United States, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. It's a billion dollar enterprise that is designed on the same model as getting the stories of the guy who built the water system in uh, Ed Couch. And so this is my, my thought, and this, this is this, this concept. I don't know if it's a breakthrough, but one other thing I'd like to say, and this is, really has more to do with the news, I suppose, than um, uh, rural community. I, in my life, I've lived in Kentucky, all except for a couple of years in graduate school, and then I went to the University of Pittsburgh. And, and, and that community has been in the news where these 11 people were killed in the temple there. That, that was just a block and a half from the community I, I stayed in, the people I, I was with, and, and um, I, I was just a hillbilly. I'd never been away from home. I didn't, um, I, I was fascinated by it, but I didn't understand it. You know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd walk by that fire station where these people, the firemen had now been in the, the temple for the, the services, and I, I would, uh, you know, I'd go to the, the bar on the corner, you could get 30 cent draft beers, you know, even on a TA salary, you could drink a lot of 30 cent beer. And um, I, I would, uh, I would go to the delis in this community just to watch people eat. I never saw anything like it, you know. I don't know what a gefilte fish is, or people ordering tongue. I never, I never been around any kind of uh, community like that. And there would be these um, weekend matinees. You go to the movies, and there would be these little women and babushkas, and you try not to look, but you could see on their arms the tattoos, the numbers from where they've been in the concentration camps. And I, I've just been thinking this. Um, that, you know, those people took me in. I was a stranger. I didn't, I thought I knew a lot, and it turned out I didn't, you know, but they were, 
tolerant. They were nurturing with me. They, they were kind and instructive. And in a way, you know, they kind of, I was from a small community. They helped me grow taller. And um, I've been thinking about that in the context of, um, you, you know, everybody, in this country, everybody's needed, right? Nobody's expendable. You're the fireman. You're the rabbi. You're the person who makes the egg salad at the deli. Everybody's important. And if we create economies that around the perception of each other as a value, then we got a chance. And that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping for. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions, but let me, um, while Dee's coming back up, <clears throat> he spoke at our conference last year on the many futures of work, and some of the ideas that he presented here was a different speech, but some of the ideas he presented here, he also presented uh, at the conference. And one of the reasons we asked Dee to come on board was because of <clears throat> how really it affected our thinking about the future of work and how we think about <clears throat> what the role of the workforce system is overall. Um, he made the point about people in rural communities talk about themselves in terms of what they used to do. It's not exclusive to rural communities because I see this all over the place. I see this with teachers. I see this with people <clears throat> in various walks of life. <clears throat> and I think that the, the, it really resonated with us uh, at the Institute because one of the sort of the mantras over the last decade or two is that people need to get used to the idea of the fact they're going to have three or four or five careers over the lifetime. And, and I got to thinking, I said, well, how do you change who you are? How do you think about changing careers if that's what you identify with? And can we think of can we think of careers as more of an arc of many different kinds of jobs, but that still grind, are still grounded in that identity, that doesn't deny the, the individual's identity? And it was, it was been enormously inspirational for us. And he doesn't know it, and he told me not to make too much of a deal of it about him, but it has, it has really changed a lot of our own thinking in terms of some of, some of the work that we're doing, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in one of our workshops. So there are elements, when I look back about my life, I've had probably a dozen different jobs. I can link them all together in terms of a career. Now I'm lucky in that respect because I can sort of say, okay, well, there's this connection and that connection. I would propose that especially with all of you and all of us who work with adults, and particularly for people who are now in, you know, in their 50s and older, and you're saying to them, well, you need to sort of change who you are. My response is you need to think about how is it that you build on what they are. And you think about their, their life as a long career with many different pieces to it, but to have connective tissue. So it's just a thought, it, you know, this, what, what Dee talked about, really goes well beyond rural. It is grounded in rural life and thinking and his experiences there, but it really touches, I think, in all of us. So anyway, I'm gonna go leave this for questions, but I just wanna sort of let you know that this has, this has had a material effect in terms of our own thinking, in terms of our own approaches and how we, we look towards thinking about the many futures of work. So anyway. I'll have a quick second, one okay. second. So let me just give you a little bit of a context. So we have 15 minutes of Q&A. We have a 30 minute break between 1.30 and two o'clock. But then we have six amazing sessions uh, starting at 
two o'clock. Um, what, and I, I, I'm saying this because this is the first time we are now pivoting and mixing um, broader issues in the workforce space and broader opportunities uh, to explore new ideas and new collaborations, uh, mixing that in with our CSEP training program. Um, so in BATIC A, we have smart partnerships between business and the workforce system. BATIC B, CSEP and WIO are collaborations and community development finance initiatives with my old friend Mike Bell, who's in the audience. And that's a collaboration potentially between um, cooperatives, credit unions, um, and the workforce system um, around workforce issues. Uh, Robert Andrews will reappear um, for another session on serving ex-offenders. We have a session on continuous learning and training with Stephen Mitchell, Associate Vice President of Sullivan Community College. Cardinal B, staying relevant, how workers can become anti-fragile. Peter Credicos and Baron Zodin, no, Baron, I, I do apologize. <laughs> and then we have um, another session at Traver Time, uh, what customer satisfaction tells us about our performance with Bob Harudian and Glendale Johnson from Senior Service America. So for the next 15 minutes, I know you guys have been taking copious notes. Um, I've seen a few of you tweet. So let's um, engage in a conversation around the lessons we can learn from our rural communities. We have microphones in the room. I was a school teacher, and the one the the lesson I, I remember learning is, uh, you know, uh, just wait them out, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it seems strange to us. We don't, we don't understand how, we, we don't recognize how we use abstraction in our lives and in our businesses and our, our world. We, you know, in this, in this country, we market shelf space. We market naming rights. We market the space above a building, the view shed. We, we market things that are just in our imagination. And we charge for them, and we sell them to each other. And um, uh, there are ways that we can begin to plan for communities that we want to live in. There are rules that we can make for smarter, greener, more inclusive communities that um, have to do with just um, moving from the abstraction to some um, concrete guidelines or markers for, and we do it all the time, but it just seems weird when we hear it about kindness or inclusion. That always seems weird, but it's. Uh, but we definitely make rules about keeping people away, not allowing them to do this. So it, it just takes a leap of faith. The uh, question from me: um, You have lived. <laughs> well. So you've been a, a, a cultural commentator, um, an economic development practitioner. 
um, a storyteller about the conditions and experiences of our rural communities. You want to know how those jobs pay? Not quite. Not, not, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, you've traveled the world and you have provided counsel to foreign communities and governments in Australia, across Africa. And yet we are living in a very troublesome time, as you know. Given history and given your informed perspective and given the, the time to reflect, what gives you hope? Yeah. Well, a lot gives me hope. I mean, I, um, so like I said, I come from a poor place. I, I go into a schoolroom in um, Belfry, Kentucky, which is right up against the West Virginia border. And I see these kids in science classes going, trying to create cancer protocols. They're, they're taking kudzu and turning it into material that they're then um, uh, using 3D printers to turn into prosthetic devices to sell in the community at a cheaper price. I, I, I saw that same group went to India this year because they created a system for uh, cleaning up fouled waterways. I see a lot that gives me courage, that makes me think that things are going to go better, but also think that you can't pretend that bad things aren't happening. And one of the things that makes it frustrating for a lot of us is that in this country, we're all getting our news and information from different places, and some of those places are kind of weaponized. You know, it's, it's hard to explain it, but, you know, there was a time we were all watching Walter Cronkite or we were all reading the, the daily news, and now we've kind of been pulled off and we're getting, we're picking our own news sources and they're confirming our own biases and then there's some people who figured out how to take advantage of that. So it's harder to break through with hopeful messages if there are people who have um, kind of got a monopoly on uh, more divisive messages. So that's, that's part of the thing that we're trying to work on and it, and I wouldn't, um, hope, hope maybe, but you know, it, it gives me, it's at least a challenge that I think it's worth our time. I have two questions for you, sorry. The first one is you mentioned earlier in your presentation that within, within a number of years that the rural community would be more reflective of people of color. And I was wondering if you could talk about why that is. And then the second question is, uh, many of us cover rural areas in terms of trying to find employment for folks. And I wondered if you could talk about the industry or work from home um, opportunities within rural communities. Yep. Well, the projections are, uh, um, um, we've covered them in the Daily Yonder, and it's, <laughs> what, what it is is that so there are 3,000 counties in, in the country, and most of those counties are going to be majority um, people of color by around 2040. That's, that's a projection. You know, a lot of times these projections, they, they may be slower, they may be realized faster. A lot of that has to do with immigration rates. Uh, a lot of it has to do with um, um, kind of immigration patterns, internal immigration patterns in the South as, as people are moving from urban areas to rural areas. Um, and it also can happen because in a sparsely and more sparsely populated rural county, it doesn't take as many people to change that, right? So, and, and so, um, what was the second part of your question? Because I think I've kind of got it. It was, could you talk about work from home opportunities, especially as it relates yep. to individuals in rural communities? Because a lot of communities. Well, one, of the, yeah, uh, one of the real issues is, 
is broadband deployment. And um, real people are paying more for crappier service. It's just, it's just the way it is. And uh, you turn on the television, every, every carrier tells you that they're getting all over the country and they're giving you great service. And it's just not the reality, but we, d we have to live with this perception that that service is there. But, though, but, those, but it, you can go pretty much to any rural county and, and the, the local officials will be saying that's the number one complaint that they're getting. So the technology is getting ready to deliver a whole new set of solutions, whether the, it's not the solutions that you're going to get in San Diego or these gigabit cities, but there are going to be a lot more experiments that are working. We're, we're doing one in our county right now where we're trying to create faster, cheaper service for people so that, peop so that people who are on low income can get connected in ways that their kids can uh, compete in school so they'll have some chance of health reform working for them so they can bring their goods and services to market so they can participate in, um, in the electoral process. So, you know, it's a, it's a slog, but um, I think the technology is going to offer some new solutions. It's just we're not getting it from the incumbent carriers who are working. Okay, so I actually, um, I'm from here around Dallas, but I lived up in West Virginia, Appalachian area for about five years or more. Um, and so I live in a rural area here and it was very rural up there. And I saw a big movement on um, early childhood, trying to educate young people in that area. Um, and from what I was a part of and saw, trying to expand their minds and basically get them educated so they can move on to bigger and better things. Um, but that didn't happen because what happened, like you said, they have culture in their heart and they don't want to move on to other places. So how do we start to try to, and there's literally no employment in these small towns, how do we try to entice businesses back in, the factories are gone, the mines are gone, and there's not those things here in this area, but there are other rural um, barriers. So how do we try to entice businesses and corporations to come back to provide these employment opportunities? Because in the end, the people end up losing hope. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think the, um, there are a lot of efforts to bring big powerhouse industry into these communities. And mostly they fail. And, and uh, they're often uh, accompanied with financing schemes and they get, you know, the businesses get so much incentive and they, and for however how long that incentive is, 10 years or whatever, they'll take that incentive and then they'll hightail it out. So in some ways that, that alternative that we were just talking about, if it's gig economy, if it's working from your laptop, if it's being connected th through the rest of the world, is, is I think probably more likely to be a um, sustaining future than these other jobs. But, but the reality is that if you make your community a good community where people want to live there, then then people come with ideas and they create the jobs. And in some ways, people who want to come there, who are not paid to come there, give you more of a chance to uh, hang on and sustain yourself. Uh, okay, Tiffany, my question was almost the same, but I have an additional question. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Kathy Quillins. Um, I'm with Matt from New Caney, Texas, right here in Texas. My question is, along with Tiffany's, is um, what is your suggestion on identifying those employers in these rural communities where our uh, 55 and plus uh, workers can work? Um, let's say a, 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 a wife of a farmer who hadn't worked 40 years, now she's in our job training program, and the only thing in that rural area is a museum and a big billboard. 
So how do we attract, where do we find the resources or the employers in those areas? Well, I mean, that you can quickly get above my pay grade on this. So I, I, I can say that um, the resources for different communities are different. I've, I've worked in philanthropy and I've worked um, around different government programs, but I'm, I'm not really facile with, with these. But what I, what I can say is there's a real need for solutions and that if we can succeed, that's a real, that's, that's a kind of a bankable asset that so many of these attempts fail to, to work with people who've been addicted, to work with people who've been abused, to work with people who have been displaced for a long time. So when you can succeed and show it, then that becomes a model, that becomes a, a ray of hope that others then can begin to figure out how you systematize that. So I don't know if that's much help, but that's kind of the way I think. Yeah. 